Good morning, everybody. My name is Josh, and welcome to the first episode of Taste of Nostalgia. This series covers games that were a big part of my childhood, games that I have spent countless hours over the years playing, games that continue to bring me a sense of nostalgia every time I boot them up without fail. But why do they make me feel nostalgic? What makes these games so special to me? What memories always come flooding back to me when I pick up the controller? These questions will all be answered and then some, as I break these games down and relive pieces of my childhood for you. During the making of these episodes, I play through these games once again from start to finish, and write the script as I go so that I never miss a memory or story that comes back to me when I play these games again. Also, if you enjoy this series and want to see more, consider subscribing and letting me know what game you want to see next. Now let's get into it. So what is on the menu today, you might ask? Well, the game I'll we'll be discussing in this episode is none other than Donkey Kong 64. Donkey Kong 64 was introduced to me by my friends that I used to go to a daycare slash after school program with when I was roughly three years old. I have beaten this game a few times over the years, but I actually never beat this game as a kid. The first time I beat this game is when I played a ROM of the game while I was still in high school. Growing up, this was my favorite game to play. I could boot up this game as a kid and spend all day just wandering around, trying to find the golden bananas or small colored bananas. I would even just wander around certain worlds in the game just because I found them fun to explore. I also found the multiplayer of this game to be a ton of fun and would spend hours every day playing it with my friends as a child. Donkey Kong 64 has provided me with many memories over the many years that I've played it. Like I said in the introduction, my friends and I could never actually beat this game. It wasn't that the game was hard, it was that we had no idea how to get the Nintendo coin, which is what you need to help get the final key to unlock the final boss. Keep in mind that this was back in the early 2000s, and we had no access to internet to simply google how to get the coin. The coin, as it turned out, was hidden in the Donkey Kong arcade game in Frantic Factory, the third world in the game. We somehow got the Rare Rare coin from the Jetpack minigame, but the Nintendo coin is something that we could never figure out. But to be fair, we were just little kids during this time. The most memorable parts of Donkey Kong 64 to me were the boss fights in the game. In my opinion, Donkey Kong 64 has some of the most memorable bosses I have ever played in gaming. As a kid, I would start a new save file just so I could run through the game and refight the bosses of this game. I also spent a lot of time playing the multiplayer of this game with my friends. I was always really bad at the game's multiplayer, now that I think about it, but it was still a lot of fun to play. But there are so many more memories with this game that I could make this video over an hour long, just naming them all. To make this video, I played through the entire game once again to relive all the nostalgic memories that I have within this game, and here's how it went. We start off with the hub of the world, DK Isles. DK Isles, like any other open world video game, is a tutorial that turns into the main hub of the game where you access all the other levels from. As a kid, I always found the tutorials simple and effective, and that holds true to this day. Granted, I know the controls by heart at this point. It is always nice though when a video game tutorial doesn't drag on. The tutorial in Donkey Kong 64 is quick and simple, and doesn't take more than a couple minutes at most if you have played through this game before. I always enjoyed exploring DK Isles as a kid, and I would love how you would be rewarded for your exploration with golden bananas or fairies. One thing that this game does great is encourage exploration. This is one of the reasons why the game had such high replay value to me as a kid. Even when I was stuck and didn't know where to go, I could always just backtrack and explore and eventually stumble across more golden bananas that would help me unlock the later levels in the game. We move on to the first level in the game, Jungle Japes. The first thing I always noticed about this level was the awesome soundtrack of this that features a trombone player who is always going hard in the pain. Seriously, how can you not jam out to this song when you first hear it? There isn't really anything special about Jungle Japes besides recruiting Diddy Kong, which would explain why I never really got back into this level as a kid. I would simply try and breeze through it in order to get to my favorite levels later on in the game. I will say though, I really like how open this level is in the main area, with all the different elevations and rooms it has. Its maze-like design makes the world feel much bigger than it really is. It is also here that we have the first arena fight in the game. I absolutely loved the arena fights as a kid, and I can still say that I feel that way all these years later. Even on split-screen multiplayer, I really enjoyed the arena fights. The crowd noises that cheer when you got hit, and the boos when you hit an enemy really makes you feel like an underdog. The arena is a fun challenge in a game that can feel pretty easy at times. 
There are tedious tasks in this game which I will discuss later, but the arena fights are always a blast for me. While I was in this world, I obtained all 5 bananas for both Diddy and Donkey Kong. With that, it is time to face off against the boss, Armadillo. The boss of this world, Armadillo, is a pretty straightforward boss to beat. Even as a kid, I did not have a problem with him. Replaying this game hasn't changed my opinion of him. He's a simple tutorial boss of sorts, and isn't really a challenge at all. You're just running and dodging fire attacks, and then throwing a barrel at him when he opens his tank. With that out of the way, we move on to the second level in the game, Angry Aztec. When I entered the lobby for Angry Aztec, I came across the ghost door that comes in every lobby. I remember these used to creep the hell out of me as a kid. Was anyone else like that? Or was it just me? Anyways, back to the game. As a kid, I did not care much for Angry Aztec. It wasn't my least favorite level in the game, but it was not super fun for me to play. I feel the same way about this level to this day. Apart from getting Tiny and Lanky Kong, there is not much to look forward to in this world. Whenever I would play through this level though as a kid, I would always beeline it for Tiny Kong. Tiny is hands down my favorite character in not only this game, but any Donkey Kong game. I always remembered playing as her in multiplayer against my friends. I don't know why she is my favorite to play as, but she just is. I collect as many bananas as I can, and I move on. Also, did this stupid beetle make anyone else's life a living hell when they were kids? Or just when they played through this game in general? I swear, when I won this race for the first time as a kid, you'd think I just won an Olympic gold medal. And even all these years later, this stupid beetle is still giving me problems. I don't know why, but I do know that it fills me with a lot of rage. The boss of this map, Dogadon, who in my opinion, is the most forgettable boss in the game. I have played through this game many times over the years, but every time I come to Angry Aztec, I always forget who the boss is. It's understandable why this boss is forgettable, as all you do is to beat him is run around and throw barrels at him when he lands. It's the same method as Armadillo, yet Armadillo is easier to remember because it's the first boss. Anyways, we beat Ogadon, get the key, and we move on to the third world in the game, and my personal favorite, Frantic Factory. We now move on to my personal favorite world in the game, Frantic Factory. This is where most of my memories of the game are at. As a kid, I would come straight for this level whenever I would boot up the game, and I could spend all day just wandering around, collecting bananas, and trying to get a layout of the place. Keep in mind, I'm like around ages 3 to 9 at this point. I used to be very easy to entertain, if I'm being honest. One of the first things I would ever do in this world is go straight for Chunky Kong. Chunky is my second favorite Kong behind Tiny, and I always found him to be really funny. A meme, if you will. This place is a giant maze of a level, which honestly, I like in a world. I don't like video game worlds that are linear in gameplay. I like it when a level forces me to learn its routes and rewards me for exploring such as Fa Frantic Factory does. Frantic Factory is also home to my favorite boss in any video game I have ever played, Mad Jack. But we will get to him in a little bit. In this world, lies what was the bane of my friends and I's existence. When we were trying to complete this game, the original Donkey Kong game, like I said at the beginning of this episode, we never figured out that the coin we were missing was in this stupid arcade machine. We never got the original banana for beating the first three levels of it. Granted, we were only kids. But I still wish to this day that I could go back in time and tell our younger selves back then where the missing coin was so we could actually finish the game. The game we in invested so many hours into. It is also in this world that we experienced the greatest hell in this entire game. Beaver bother. I don't know who hurt the game developer who designed this minigame, but they clearly wanted us to suffer. This minigame is totally luck based, as these goddamn beavers never want to go in the hole. I know there's a metaphor in here somewhere about my love life. Seriously, who hurt the game dev who designed this? Also, for the record, who approved this minigame? I don't know what's worse. Tiny's races against that fucking beetle, or the beaver bother minigames? Let me know what you think down below. Ugh, this minigame fills me with so much hate. Speaking of things that don't fill me with hate, Mad Jack. Mad Jack is not only my favorite boss in this game, but my favorite boss in any video game. That's right, out of all the video games I've played throughout my life, Mad Jack is my absolute favorite, hands down. Everything about Mad Jack is unique. His design is badass, his level layout is super cool, and fully, fully utilizes Tiny's twirl flight skill. I remember as a kid, 
I would start a new game on Donkey Kong 64 and play through the first three levels just so I could face off against Mad Jack again, and again, and again. Little did I know that there is a boss rematch option through the main menu once you collect enough banana fairies. But I honestly did not care about that. I enjoyed playing this game so much that I had no problem starting a new file in one of the extra slots to face Mad Jack again without deleting my friends and I's main save. This rematch actually gave me a little bit of trouble as Mad Jack baited me super hard on a couple of bad reads that I made. One thing that I love about this fight is how it is played. You run platform to platform evading Mad Jack and when he stops, you body slam the switch on the correct color. The reason why I appreciate this boss fight is because the previous two boss fights in this game involve you running side to side throwing an explosive barrel at the boss. Pretty straightforward, but Mad Jack for a while will force you to make reads and hope he doesn't land on the same spot as you. He is a pretty simple boss to fight once you realize that he can't jump diagonally or that he'll slow down when he catches up to you. So to beat him, you can just fly around in circles as he follows you. I always lure him to the center platforms and then run in circles until he stops. That way the switch is never too far away with me right in the center when he stops. This fight would be even better if they made you have to jump corners to evade him and even have to juke him out. Because in the fight as it is, he hauls ass to catch up to you then slows down when he does instead of just running you over. This boss fight is a lot of fun though, but imagine if you had to juke Mad Jack to survive his later forms. Would that not be insane? Wow. I just now realized I wrote a whole page of script for this boss fight. It just goes to show you that I really like the Mad Jack boss fight. But with him out of the way, it is time to move on to one of my least favorite levels in the game, Gloomy Galleon. Gloomy Galleon is the fourth level in the game. If I could describe this level in two words, it would be tedious and boring. Something to know about me is that I find water levels in video games very annoying. They are way too wide open, slow to complete, and often have a lackluster challenge outside of total bullshit. I can't be the only one who doesn't like water levels in video games. Let me know what your thoughts are down below. Thankfully, at the start of this level, we are at 77 golden bananas, so we only need to get a, the blueprints and do the boss fight here. We can get the 23 bananas we need left to unlock the final level elsewhere. However, Mama didn't raise no bitch, so I'm gonna get all the golden bananas here. I suffer for your enjoyment. Leave a like if you appreciate my hard work and suffering that I do for all of you. Let's get to it. It is kind of hard to get good footage for this level. As you can see in sub areas, it is very poorly lit, and if your only source of light is this little fish that can't keep up with you, it almost never looks in the direction that you want him to. See what I mean on why I don't really like this level? This level plays really slow because you're almost always swimming around. As a kid, I would always avoid this level. I'd just go in, get the blueprints, fight the boss, and get the hell out. There really isn't much more for me to say about Gloomy Galleon, so let's just move on to the boss, shall we? Puff Toss. Puff Toss is a diamond in the rough for Gloomy Galleon. Just like Mad Jack in the previous world, Puff Toss has a unique style to how you fight him. It's simple. You ride around in your little boat and drive through the DK rings to deal damage. Each time you hit them, the rings get smaller. I really enjoy this boss fight, not as much as Mad Jack, but I still very much enjoy this. His theme is badass, and his design is simple, yet cool and intimidating. This Puff Toss fight actually gave me a little bit of trouble this time around. I actually enjoyed the challenge very much. With way too many times around him hitting targets, I defeated Puff Toss on my first try giving me the 4th world completed, and allowing us to go on to the 5th world in this game, Fungi Forest. Fungi Forest is in my opinion the worst level in this entire game. Everything about this world to me, in my opinion, is forgettable. I have played through these worlds countless times, and even completed this game a few times in the past 5 years, yet I can never remember hardly anything from Fungi Forest. This world is just bland and boring to me. Even though it brings in a day-night cycle to the world, which does add depth to it, this world isn't tricky by any means, and it is not tedious and annoying like Gloomy Galleon is. It is a pretty straightforward, and not too big of a map. It just is boring and forgettable to me. I don't really know how else to explain it besides that. I respect the gimmick that it's going for, and I don't judge anyone who might consider this world to be their favorite. Again, let me know what your opinions are down below. It is also in Fungi Forest that we experience the Jetpack minigame in Cranky's Lab. I honestly am super bad at this minigame, 
But the thing about Donkey Kong 64 is, if you want to beat it, you have to go through a couple really tedious minigames. That being the original Donkey Kong and Jetpack. Anyways, I blitz through this world and move on to the boss fight. A rematch with Dogodon. I enjoy this fight. They have you use Chunky in this fight instead of Diddy. I like how the boss fight starts out the same way as it does the first time you fight with Diddy. But they give Chunky his own little spin on the fight to make it more challenging and even more fun than the first round. I'm glad there is more to this boss fight than just running around dodging fire and throwing a barrel. Which is how it starts, but in this fight, you turn it into Big Chunky and you actually get a beat up on Dogodon while the stage is slowly sinking into lava. I like the addition of the seeking platform in this fight, it puts you on a timer to beat the boss. It makes you learn how to quickly deal with the boss before you just straight up die and have to start over. All in all, this boss is pretty easy. I only got hit once, and we finally finished up the worst level in the game. Now, it is on to another forgettable level with terrible lighting. The one, the only, Crystal Caves. In my opinion, I'm kind of split on how I feel about Crystal Caves. The lighting of this world is terrible, and there are a lot of tedious minigames and golden bananas in this world. To be fair though, poor lighting is something that every world in this game struggles with in dark areas. Places in the world where it feels like you're walking around in pitch blackness, it's kind of like an anti-progressive commercial. Again, I really like Crystal Caves at times, besides its issues, although I do not have very many memories with this world. This world and Fungi Forest are the levels that are just most forgettable to me. I do not know why I hardly remember this world as a kid, but I still really enjoy this world at times. There are also other things that make this world a pain in the ass, like a rematch with this goddamn speed beetle. Anytime you're having fun in this game, this stupid beetle pulls up and has to ruin everything. Ruins everything like a band kid trying to be hip and cool with the times. Anyways, after replaying this world, I understand why many would not like it. A lot of collectibles and minigames on this world are a major pain in the ass. However, I'm honestly not as bothered by it, but I totally get where people are coming from with this one. Especially with the beetle. That beetle took way too many tries. Anyways, I cleared out the level and moved on to the boss fight. It's another rematch, this time with Army Dillo. Honestly, this is the most disappointing fight of the game in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of rematches to begin with, unless they completely mix up the fight and challenge you in new ways, but Army Dillo here does not. Sure, he has new ways to damage you, but at the end of the day, you're still throwing barrels at him when he's laughing. All his attacks except the one involve running away from explosive fire attacks of some kind. At the end of the day, is this really a different style of boss fight? I sure don't think so. I will say though, the boss fight theme is one of the best in the game here. It is so badass and catchy, I could honestly listen to it all day. So there's something that the game developers did right here. Anyways, we win the fight without much trouble, and move on to a level that I really enjoy in so many ways. Creepy Castle. By far the most linear map in the game, I can understand why people do not like this world for how linear it is. However, for me, coming out of Crystal Caves and Fungi Forest, a nice simple world is just what I needed. The biggest memories that I have with this world are the soundtrack, which slaps and goes super hard all the time, and the boss fight, which I will discuss here shortly. I love the theme of this world also. One thing the game developers did right in this game is make all the worlds feel different from one another. It doesn't feel like you are playing the same world over and over again. You would think that would be standard game design, but you would be wrong. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. One of my favorite memories with this world would be me trying to speedrun this world as a kid trying to get to Hideout Helm. I mentioned earlier that I would replay this game to fight Mad Jack over and over again. Well, I would also want to replay Hideout Helm again. But I will talk about that later. Anyways, this world would always be the last hurdle between me and Hideout Helm. So naturally, as a kid eager to play the final world, I would try to get through this as quickly as possible. It is an odd memory to be fond of, but it is my best known memory of this world, believe it or not. Even though I didn't even know that speedrunning was a real thing, I would try to get through this world as fast as I could. It doesn't mean I didn't like it. It just means I was eager to play a Hideout Helm. I also would have this world playing in the background, just so I could listen to the soundtrack. Yes, this soundtrack does go that hard. This game's soundtrack goes hard in just about every world you play. I know this level very well, so it will not take me long to run through it and get the bananas and blueprints. There is one major hurdle through this world. Beaver bother. That's right, 
The cursed minigame has returned for vengeance. It got so frustrating that I had to sacrifice my ex-wife to the forbidden video for better RNG. After many moons of frustration, I finished the game and got the banana. Even worse though, you have not one beaver bother, but TWO of them! The game developers must have been really having a rough week when they designed Creepy Castle. You know something that always confused me as a kid in this game? Why does Snide need all the blueprints? He's the one who designed the laser, so why does he need all the blueprints? Sure, I get that he would need most of the blueprints to remember the design in order to stop the laser, but shouldn't he at some point have enough blueprints to remember everything about the laser? I mean, look at this. I'm only missing two blueprints, but apparently that is not enough for him to just piece everything together. Sure game, whatever you say. Anyways, I breeze through this level and move on to what is my second favorite boss in the game, King Cutout. After Mad Jack, King Cutout is my favorite boss in this game. Everything about this boss fight is so much fun, even if I always struggle with it, and especially with the timing of the third phase in this fight. As a kid, King Cutout used to always creep me out. Especially with that little scream he does when he pops up. As a little kid, it used to always creep me out without fail. My appreciation for this boss fight has developed like fine wine, as I've gotten older over the years. I love that you get to use all the Kongs in this fight, and if you miss time one phase, or miss, then that Kong is out for the fight. This boss always gives me the most trouble in the game, just because that third phase is always hard for me to time at first. Look at this footage though. I completely choke with the first four Kongs, then Diddy comes in and clutches up and wins me the fight. This is the kind of boss fight that I needed to have after the Army Dillo rematch bored me into a deep slumber. A slumber that I couldn't awaken from for almost a thousand years. Mad respect to you, King Cutout. With the cardboard cutout done with, we are officially done with the main worlds, and we can move on to the final area of this game, Hideout Helm, which is in my opinion, the best part of the game. Yes, even more fun than Frantic Factory. My absolute favorite part of the game. Hideout Helm is everything that a final world should be in a video game. The way this place works is that you have a certain amount of time to complete a total of 10 minigames between each Kong, two per Kong, to disable the laser and open up the area to K. Rule. The amount of time you have depends on how many blueprints you return to Snide. In this run, I returned all of the blueprints, so I had a maximum of 50 minutes to clear out all 10 minigames. Once you complete the minigames, the timer stops, and you can resume playing normally. I love that there is a timer for this final world. It really adds to the stakes of the world, and makes you play with a sense of urgency. Every failed minigame attempt sets you back. Some of these minigames are really easy, others gave me problems. I will say though, the bad camera of this game can really bite you here, especially if you did not have all the blueprints and are running on a very short clock. For me, I cleared out all the minigames without too much issue. As a kid, I loved this portion of the game. I loved the rush I got from shutting down the laser with time left to spare. I never once as a child returned all the blueprints, or even found them all for that matter. So completing the final world with only a, only a small chunk of time was really rewarding for me back in the day. It made me realize that I was an alpha gamer. My gaming roots run deep. Anyways, I knock out the laser and head to K. Rule's chambers. As a kid, I loved coming into the control room and being like, Ooh, that was in the opening cutscene! I used to believe as a kid that you could catch K. Rule in his chair by walking really slowly when you're going to his room. However, that is not the case, as when you open the door, he leaves. Child Me had so many interesting ideas to catch K. Rule before he left. In King K. Rule's room, we come across the major obstacle that prevented me and my friends from beating this game as a kid, the final key. As I explained earlier growing up, we did not know that the Nintendo coin was located inside the Donkey Kong arcade game. I did not even think we got the golden banana from that machine. So when we got to the final key and realized we needed the Nintendo coin, none of us knew where it was. We would backtrack on every world, convinced that we missed something. We would start new save files on other slots to see if we skipped a step, but we never knew that the coin was hidden inside the arcade game. Remember. Back in our day, we did not have internet, so we couldn't simply google where the coin was. Back then, gaming advice and information was spread by word of mouth. Playgrounds were the places to get the information on a game as a kid. Even all the way back then, we could never figure out how to get the Nintendo coin, and we never beat Donkey Kong 64. Personally, I do not know how to feel about the Nintendo coin's location. I feel like there were better ways of making the player have to work for it. You would never know that the coin was in there unless you randomly decided to play the arcade game again, 
a second time after already beating it and getting the golden banana from it. There are definitely better ways of handling the coin. Childhood me is so frustrated he didn't know the Nintendo coin was hiding in plain sight. But I have the coin, and now I have the final key. I set K Lumsy free, and now it's time for the final showdown with King K Rule. Honestly, I have mixed feelings about the final fight. I like the challenge of it and how rewarding it feels to survive the five rounds of this fight. However, there are things that I absolutely despise about this final fight. The first being the camera. The camera really is at its worst in this fight, especially with Diddy and Lanky's rounds. Depth perception is almost non-existing, and this fight can get really frustrating. Worst thing about this fight is that if you die, you have to restart the whole entire fight from the beginning. I'm more on the side of not liking this fight just because the camera is horrible, and the game punishes you for dying by being sent back to the beginning. I don't mind boss fights that make you start over from the beginning when you die, but I do have a problem with bullshit reasons for losing a fight that then make you have to restart from the beginning. If you fix the camera on this fight, I immediately like this fight 10 times more. One thing that I am not also fond of with this fight is how silly it is. The game, I felt, had a mostly serious tone to it. Sure, there were funny parts here and there in the cutscenes, but it mostly had that serious tone to it. Yet, when you jump into the ship and start the final fight, you are randomly in this boxing ring filled with people and K. Rool dressed like an idiot? I like how all five Kongs are used in their own unique ways in this fight. That takes advantage of their unique traits. But I just felt like this fight could have been presented in a different way. Let me know what you think of all this down below. I just think it's kind of silly, and it just has a sudden tone change to the game that it would that had been building up the whole the whole game. Chunky phase is my absolute favorite of the five phases in this fight. You have to body slam a switch, then turn invisible, then jump in a barrel, and then time a punch on K. Rule. This phase is the most hands-on and does not depend completely on a camera cooperating with you. To be good at Chunky Phase, you just have to have good timing. After many attempts, I land the final punch with Chunky Kong and finish the game. That was such a great time. I was so happy to be able to play through this game again and document my journey through this game and share my memories and thoughts as well. All in all, I would say that this is a solid game overall. I know that this game gets dogged on a lot and people love to point out its flaws. This game is not perfect, and is its fair share of issues, the camera being my main issue with the game. Another issue that I have with this game is its tedious level design at times. Some of the levels, like Frantic Factory, Angry Aztec, and Jungle Japes, hold up really well, and I really enjoy playing them. While other levels like Gloomy Galleon, Fungi Forest, and Crystal Caves can be really tedious and a chore to complete. I also think that the coins in this game were underused. They should have been rarer, as at the end of the run, all Kongs had over 100 extra coins each. Either there should have been more use for the coins, or make the coins rarer. That might be a bit of a hot take to have, but it's just how I feel about the coins. I also feel like you unlock characters too early. After beating the second world Angry Aztec, you already have 4 out of the 5 Kongs, and after the third world, you will have all 5. I think the Kongs should have unlocked one level at a time. Have Diddy and Jungle Japes, Tiny and Angry Aztec, Lanky and Frantic Factory, and Chunky and Gloomy Galleon. That would pace the gameplay a little better in my opinion. Let me know what you think down below. However, at the end of the day, I still enjoy this game even with its flaws. This is one of, if not the first ever video game I ever played on console. I have known this game my whole life, and I am always met with lots of memories playing this game every time I boot it up. At the end of the run, I finished with 189 out of the 201 possible golden bananas for a completion percentage of 93% in a little under 24 hours. I was not expecting to play this much out of the game for this video, but as I kept playing, I found myself chasing the 101% rating. I had to stop myself from getting the full completion due to time restraints that I set for myself. The only bananas I were missing came from DK Isles. I ended up completing every single main world in this game beside it. I really enjoy this game and found myself getting lost in it again. If you have made it this far in the video, thank you so much. I had a blast playing through Donkey Kong 64 again. Getting to experience this game again always puts a smile on my face, and I hope that this video was fun for you as much as it was for me to make. If you like it, please consider leaving a like on it, and if you want to see more, subscribe if you haven't. 
Let me know down below what games make you nostalgic. What memories do you have of that game? Do you still play it to this day? I read all the comments and do my best to reply to them as quickly as I can. Who knows? You might inspire a new video game to appear on this series. You never know. Once again, thank you all for watching and have a nice day.